Good evening. Welcome to this retrospective tasting in two parts, celebrating two decades of delicious whiskey from Compass Box and John Glazer, who I'll be inviting on the screen very soon. Um, many of you will have these very, very special packs, which uh, we we're greatly indebted to John for providing the bottles for because we are not tasting. Well, with the exception of one whiskey that we'll taste at the end, which is uh, currently available, the rest are plundered straight from his archive. So we're tasting whiskey from 2001 to 2013 um, that are no longer available, haven't been on our shelves for a very long time. So uh, it, it's really kind of uh, John to liberate this whiskey, which has all been carefully rebottled. Thank you, Greg, uh, for your enjoyment uh, tonight. So you should all have your, your guides of the order, uh, starting with Asyla, then Eleuthera, the Spice Tree inaugural batch, double single the last vatted grain, the general, and then finally the uh, newly released whiskey, Rogue's Banquet. So you should have all that all laid out in front of you. So I don't need to give too much context to, um, to, to John and we'll bring him on. But, uh, and questions as well. Um, we may have time for um, a Q and A at the end, if you type comments in Facebook or YouTube. Um, uh, we'll see how we go. If not, uh, we can also revisit uh, the questions that are asked, pick some of our favourite favourites and do those on the second part of this tasting. So uh, let's bring John on. John, how are you this evening? Hello, Arthur. I'm very good, thank you. Very good. Good. Well, thank you again for uh, joining us, giving us your time and your whiskey and uh, congratulations. Uh, two decades, 20 years. Two decades, twenty years. Yeah, it's um, it's it's really hard for me to believe it. Um, God, it just it still feels so recent that I I uh, drove from Elgin to Edinburgh after bottling the first whiskey hedonism and and sold a couple of cases to you guys. Yeah, it's twenty years. Yeah, well, thanks for remembering that. And it was uh, I remember we also celebrated your tenth birthday in Edinburgh. Yeah, we did in a big room. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's great that you remember that first. Well, and, and it was very much my intent, and I've been thinking about this for many, many months pre-COVID, um, that I would, I wanted to do another. You know, we did something together from the tenth to celebrate that very first sale that started the Compass Box Company all those years ago, and I very much intended to, to call you up and ask you guys to do it again at the twentieth. And uh, never would I have dreamed seven or eight or nine months ago that we'd be doing it this way. But here we are, making the best of it. Yeah, it's a good format. I like it. So, yeah. in fact, a, a little bit of housekeeping, how we're going to do it tonight. You, you guys have always been uh, so good at sharing your wisdom on flavour and carefully considered presentation of flavour and what goes into your whiskey. So we've, um, uh, with James Saxon's help and your design team, with each whiskey, we're going to bring up your flavour wheels, but not reveal exactly what the parts represent so you can engage your brain and then at the end we'll, we'll kind of at the end of each whiskey should i say we will uh, reveal uh, which sections of the pie chart mean mean what and i think it's also worth reminding ourselves what some of these bottles look like because so many of them haven't been on the shelf ancient history so, that <laughs> so yes we are starting um with the silo and uh back then the whiskey industry was a little different john it was a little different, you know, so yeah, I mean, 20 years ago, I mean, the first whiskey just for, for the historians out there was, was this, was, was, was hedonism. And this is, this is from that very first batch. So this was bottled on October 23rd, 2000. And then I put cases into the boot of the car and drove down to, to Edinburgh to see, to see Keir and you guys at, and the guys at, at, at Royal Mile at the time. Um, but that's that's what started it. Now, sadly, we only we didn't have enough bottles of this in the archive to you know to, to release some for this. We did have one, which I, I, we 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 given to Royal Mile, and you'll talk about that later. But that was the first one. That was two thousand, and then Asyla followed. Uh, uh, that was October two thousand. This followed March two thousand one. Asyla. That's a very different time, as you said. 
you 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 said his name, so shall I make him appear? There we go. Oh, as if by magic. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Kier. Hello, congratulations. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah there's. <laughs> I do love telling the story here, uh, and I, I, I have told it over the years, and and it is crazy when you think back on it. Um, yeah, good folks at Gordon McPhail, you know, uh, you and Macintosh at the time, you know, helped uh, me get Compass Box off the ground. They, they bottled our very first whiskey, and and my wife Amy, pregnant at the time with our first child with with his Josh, um, drove up to Kergelaki and 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 stayed there the night before at the, at, the, at the Highlander Inn and I hand numbered all the labels. And next morning we went over to Elgin and, and, and those two casks actually that we just showed, there they are. Those were the first two casks that comprised the very first hedonism. It was just two casks. It was that old Caledonian on the left from 1980, distilled 1980, bottled 20 years later. And that old canvas 1990 at 10 years old, first filled barrel. Um, and a, a wine treated hogshead, which is a story in and of itself. But, um, uh, you know, and the two of them, the, the, the fruitiness of the younger one, the depth of the older one, just created a balance. That, it took me six months to figure it out. There's the Highlander in there. We stayed the night before. Um, yeah. And uh, and there's Tetsuya, you know, at the bar. This is, this is a few years later. He wasn't there in 2000, but um, we'll come back to that. It's double single. But yeah, and we bottled it in the morning. Literally put the cases, cases, filled the boot of the car, and drove down to see you. And uh, I was parked on oh, I, I just forgot the name of the street, the, the one that goes down the hill. Um, off the, yeah, and I left Amy in the car, and you know, illegally parked, and uh, I ran out and, and went to see you guys. And and we went down into the basement, the cellar, yeah. as I recall. Yeah. I opened a bottle, first bottle. I take it back. There was another bottle I opened. I had to. I had before I drove down. We we drove. We left Elgin. Um, Amy being pregnant at the time, we had to stop at the McDonald's because she really, really needed some food. And I sat in the car park and I opened the first bottle and I did this with it because I had to. So the second bottle I opened was four hours later down in Edinburgh with you. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was great. My my recollection of it was that you called on the day. You, you called me just as you were leaving Elgin and said, I'm going to be down in Edinburgh later. In <laughs> and I, I, right, yeah. I seem to remember, I'm not sure if I'm totally recalling it correctly, but I seem to remember you were rushing to get there before we closed as well. That's what I seem to remember. Well, that makes sense because we probably wouldn't have left before noon or or, 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 or one or something. I, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, that's right. That's ringing a bell now that, yeah, I called. <laughs> On the day, some salesman I was. Yeah, hey. yeah, no. <laughs> but it was anyway. great. It was, it was, you know, we obviously got a lot of people knocking on our door trying to sell us whiskey at the time, and but nothing obviously like this. You know, it was uh, yeah. unique at the time. I didn't know if you're mad or if you're a genius, but uh, yeah. <laughs> you're clearly, clearly you're a genius. <laughs> no, no, neither. Just a, a survivor. <laughs> Well, yeah, that was so, and then you ordered two cases. That was, you know, that was that was what that was amazing to me. And I, yeah, this is this is so long ago that that picture we showed of the casks earlier. I just found that picture that that we just pulled up um, this morning, literally that one. I found that that was a photograph. I mean, we've got boxes of all. So it was so long ago I started this company, and I probably called you on a payphone. Who yeah. <laughs> who knows? Um, that it was before I had a digital camera. Digital cameras weren't a thing back then. I had to find this this morning in boxes of old photographs. And yeah, maybe I, I called you on a payphone from a payphone. Who knows? But uh, here yeah, we are. How, how things have changed in the time since then, including the whiskey. Yeah, you know, I, I think that, well, actually, you know, I just want to say while we just chit chat here for a minute, for those out there with a glass of a silo, we'll come to a silo, we'll talk about it. Please sniff. Please taste, please enjoy. Cheers to you all. And we'll come back and talk more about it. But do have some whiskey while we, we, we chat. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, as I, it's hard probably for a lot of people listening to this, you know, to believe who weren't in following whiskey in 2000, that it was a really, it was a, it was a tough time for the Scotch whiskey industry. Yeah. You know, the industry was really in the doldrums. Um, you know, global sales were, you know, flat or declining. Single malts were growing, but they were so small. And, you know, people saw, oh, single malts, they had their rules about that. And it just wasn't that as approachable as things are. But now, 20 years later, I mean, look at where we are. Um, you know, 20 years ago, you know, the, the 
to now think of all the new distilleries that have come on stream, you know, big companies, new distilleries, but also, you know, all the new small distilleries that are popping up. It's just a really great time. Yeah. 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 So it's been fun to, to be a part of that. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm curious if either of you guys remember where hedonism was positioned relative to other whiskies in terms of price. Was it expensive? <laughs> was it, um, it couldn't have been that expensive if we bought two cases of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will tell you, I, re I know exactly what it was selling. We, we priced it to, it was selling for 40 pounds a bottle in 2000. It was, and and people, you probably didn't, you would have sold it for something less than I suppose, but um, the that's what we were, that was the, 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 the retail price typically, which was, I was, it was expensive back then, and I got a lot of flack for that. You know, this is really nice, John, this is beautiful whiskey, but it's expensive. I did the math on it, literally, I did this this morning as well. I did it, it 40 pounds in 2000, how much is it worth today based on inflation? 67 pounds or something like that really right. and yeah. which is probably not far off what you're selling hedonism for today so there you go we, have, we've just yeah. let, we, we haven't jacked it up we've just let inflation you know take you know, take its course uh, your your question arthur about positioning it the positioning it in the shop was challenging because yeah. you know even the grains there were, there were grain whiskey at the time, you could occasionally get Cameron Brig. It wasn't always available. And then uh, Invergordon 10-year-old. And we, we had bought the last 60 bottles, um, which were unlabeled, of Stillman's Dram um, Invergordon, which is a 22-year-old. Um, and that was the only old grain that we'd come about with at the time. So it was, uh, it was pretty unusual working out where to put it on the shelves. <laughs> right. Well... And it would look so different as well. Yeah. Everything was brown or green or grey or <laughs> tartan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we, we got a bottle in the window first thing on the Saturday morning. You know, it's, uh, it drew, drew people's eyes, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Great. So that was the green whiskey, yeah. That started yeah. it all. Yeah. And uh, Silas followed pretty soon after. It's... Um, yeah, and so, it's so oh, good to yeah. travel. I, I yeah. love to say that. I, I... Well, what I want people to think about when you smell this is is what I wanted to do back then, and I changed the recipe very shortly after this batch. But then um, was a creamy is what I wanted. Creamy. Mm -hmm. I wanted creamy and approachable, and and so with a sila, you know, I started with hedonism because I wanted I wanted to do something that would frankly get people's attention and show them a side facet of scotch whiskey that not many people were aware of you know, how good old grain whiskey can be and we'll come to an old grain whiskey later in this tasting but uh with a silo i wanted to make something that bars could use and people could you know who were big enthusiasts of single malt whiskies could drink on a daily basis and i wanted it to be approachable and, and that creaminess is what i wanted so from the beginning what silo has always been about is malt whiskey and grain whiskey so that but everything from first filled barrels, American oak barrels. So you get the creaminess, the vanilla character. And so this, well, I'm, I'm like, Arthur, you lead me. I'm, I'm jumping to, to the, the geeky details that uh, creamy. Well, I, I wrote creamy, sweet, elegant, sweet grain, uh, peaches and cream. Um, yeah, basically what you're saying. It's so approachable. It's so delicious, but also it's, it's got weight on the palate as well. Um, it's not. It's it, it's not light either, which is a good thing. There's complexity. There's roundness. There's fullness in the palate. And I think that came from well. There's some old grain whiskey in here, but the quality of the the first fill barrel aged whiskies you know, gives it more sort of you know wood sugars and sweetness and loveliness. Um, we didn't chill filter anything, so we kept all the natural oils of the malt whiskey in there. Um, and so yeah, that, that, that fatness. And <laughs> so when I released this in March of 2001, remember I told you Amy was pregnant, we went to the McDonald's in Elgin when we bottled hedonism you know, back in October. Well now fast forward, now it's April. We just released a silo. I was doing a whiskey show in London, one of the early ones. And it happened to be like a 10 minute walk from the hospital where my first son Josh was born. So I had whiskey with me and I put it in the, bassinet with him he, he, this is still in the hospital <laughs> and i took a picture 
And uh, then I walked in and then I left Amy and went to my whiskey festival, but I came back afterwards. <laughs> it was a Saturday afternoon, as I recall, or Sunday. And you've, uh, and of course, names as well is a big part of the Compass Park story with uh, yeah. no references to weather systems or places in Scotland, never a place in Scotland, which is extremely unusual. Um, yeah. the sea or anything like that and uh, and sometimes you forget where they come from so I, I was glad of this clearly uh, classical music well yeah this is this is back then this is fairly new this is Thomas Ades. Uh this was he wrote this in 2007 and and so he was quite he was a quite a young composer back then he was in his 20s and highly regarded and and I just came across it, and I, I was cap it captured my imagination, not just the music, but the name, the Sila, the plural of asylum, and, and Sila, the idea of sanctuary, maybe madhouse, and all this just, you know, I loved. And okay, so I wanted to have some names that would be different from names of the, you know, whiskeys, of the, names of the whiskeys before. So I, I decided on asylum, now it was a dumb name. <laughs> lovely word, lovely idea. But no one was, was sure how to pronounce it in, in English-speaking countries, you know, uh, Sila, you know, and what does it mean? And, and, you know, and we put this, you know, this woman on the front, you which know, you know, was sort of a Winona Ryder, young Winona Ryder, um, you know, maybe so, so having had, maybe drunk too much whiskey and playing the lute. <laughs> <laughs> and, but we all we loved it. And, you know, it's, um, it, you know, it, uh, yeah, it was, it was, as you say, it was meant to be, approachable and and, and 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 sweet and alluring I don't like that label like the picture well let's have a look uh at what is uh what is in the whiskey yeah um, so this first recipe is so today or oh, sorry sila after this batch i changed the recipe i'll be you know complete transparency as we like to be and do um this recipe was essentially a classic blended scotch whiskey proportion, a ratio, I should say, of malt whiskey to grain whiskey. Okay, so it was only, as you can see, the 28% link malt whiskey from the liquid distillery at the top there. And the rest of it was 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 grain whiskey from both the Canvas distillery and the Cameron Bridge distillery, two very different ages. Those, the, 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 the circles give you an indication um, of, of, of the ages, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But this was mostly grain whiskey. So that was the classic kind of structure, you know, 20%, 30%, 40% maybe grain, uh, malt whiskey and the rest of grain. But because the, that Cameron Bridge portion parcel was so old, it brought this extra depth. And what I did afterwards is I, I made it more of a closer to 50-50 malt and grain. And that's what a silo that you know became for, for many, many years until we had sadly had to retire a few years ago. But the whole idea remained the same, creaminess, softness, and what I like to call a subtle elegance. And it really takes people who appreciate this most tend to be people who really drink a lot of whiskey. And they come to this and it's like, wow, okay, this is special. I haven't tasted much like this before. Uh, it's not a hit you over the head shouty whiskey, but it's got some real class, I think. And anyway, it's my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you think here, but it, I think it's showing so brilliantly. Just yeah, it's, it's just I remember it. It's lovely, lovely whiskey. I used to call it, I still call it my desert island whiskey because people say of all the whiskeys you've done, we've done over a hundred. What would you, you know, if there was only one, and if I had to take one to the desert island that I had to drink every single day, you know, I could drink that every day. Well, uh, John, you've given me such a good segue here. I have to use it. Um, you're dead desert island whiskey, but Keir, I think you, unless you have anything else you want to say, you were going to sit back and relax and enjoy the drums. Yeah, no, actually, I just want to add one thing. The um, yeah. Asylum, not the first batch, but we served it at our wedding when I got yeah. married. So we, um, everyone turned up, we were at this big house, and as they walked in the door before the ceremony, they were all given a dram of Asylum. Very nice. That's what it's for, that kind of stuff. Back anyway, cheers, Keir. Nice to see you. Thanks, Keir. Cheers. cheers. <laughs> Desert Island Whiskey. Desert Island Whiskey. Right. Oh, That's Desert Island. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah. uh, leads us on to Eleuthera, the second drama of the evening. Um, it does. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I love your names. I love your branding. I love your ideas. But you pick up the second glass 
And it, it just does not taste like that, John. <laughs> mm. It does not taste like that. No, you don't look at that and think this whiskey. You don't think scotch at all, really, do you? Uh, Sila, maybe. Uh, Sila. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Okay. You yeah, I, I get that. E elegant, relaxing heaven, the Sila. But mm. Eleuthera is, is a different beast altogether. But I absolutely love it. Um, yeah. Well, it's, yeah. So it's, I've done a grain whiskey. I've done a blend of Scotch whiskey, malt and grain, and Sila. And then... Um, yeah, I, I, it was it was it was time to get into malt whiskey. You know, I've always been a fan of malt whiskeys, and and hadn't actually intended to do malt whiskeys when I first started the business. I wanted to get into blended Scotch whiskey. You know, something that we can share with the world and is approachable. You know, like a Sala. I thought maybe we'll do some variations on that over the years. But uh, I, I, frankly, I you know talking to people like you know people who would have been working at Royal Malt Whiskies at the time. You know, they they were everyone was. They're, they're, those kinds of people were supportive of what we were doing, but people saying, well, why don't you try your hand at blending just single malts? And I, I honestly hadn't thought about doing it before I started. But uh, it seemed to make sense when we put this together. Um, I named, well, I'll come back to the naming it, but um, this is one of those lovely, happy accidents, I'll tell you. The, the, this is the second batch, by the way. This is 2002, May. First one was December 2001, but the original blend was Kalila and the Klein Leash, and I had some, also some liquid in there to try to, I, I didn't want it to be as peaty as it ended up. I wanted to create, bring a little more fruit into it and make it feel slightly more approachable than what we have in the glass. And this is, you know, when I, had, I was doing all this on my own with uh, my own savings, <clears throat> you know, the first batch of head business was two casks, the silo wasn't doing more. And so there was, this was a big deal. So I, this was going to be three casks. And we were going to use a partial cask of the Linkwood and send them all up to Gordon McPhail, the good folks up there who were still bottling for us at the time. And I got in there and I got this call from, from you and McIntosh. And he said, John, I got bad news. Um, he said, your, your Kalila is a leaker. The cask is leaking. It doesn't have as much whiskey as you, you, you thought. And long story short, I just tried to reformulate with what I knew was in those casks, and I just kicked out the liquid eventually and just put together what there was of the Kalila with what I had with the Klein Leash. And I thought, this is pretty special. And that became a Luthra. It's so, an accidental blend. <laughs> yeah, I mean, here we have the pie chart. Let's just, just jump straight into seeing those ingredients. Um, yeah, sure. So, yeah, uh, yeah Klein Leash of two different types. Uh, yeah. Two different cast types and two different age types, and then Kalila. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose what what I find interesting, looking back uh, at that time and thinking about your business, how interesting it was for you to have the pick of distilleries. Not all distilleries, but um, but many of them, and those ones you favoured at a time when bulk stock was. Uh, easier to get hold of, whereas now it's difficult, <laughs> expensive, and uh, and a lot is um, taken uh, away from the market. It's just not possible to get. But you look at that that those distilleries, Kalila and Klein Leash in a vatting. What a great idea! Um, mm. That 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 waxy, fruity weight of Klein Leash with that cold tar saline maritime smoke of of Kalila. it's a superb combination it you know if i do say so myself it is in those proportions and you know i just think lucky stars that it happened that way and i would encourage the brand, the distillery owners of those just the distillery owner of those two distilleries to consider this 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 batting this this recipe for themselves um, yeah, it, it has really worked really well. But remember, you know, this is this is May 2002, and back in those times, there was still way too much whiskey, generally speaking, in 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 the, in the warehouses in Scotland. You know, it was a dire time, and you know, this stuff was distilled in this case of this whiskey, you know, 12, 14 years prior, and and, and on the anticipation that sales would eventually grow for whatever blends they were probably going to put these into. And they didn't grow as the way they thought. And they just had so much of it at that time. 
And so, yeah, I, I, my story is I worked for that company. You know, I, I worked for, for, for Diageo before starting Compass Box. And so I, I knew these whiskeys and I, I, you know, I worked on product development. And, you know, when I, I was amazed, I have to admit, you know, I was amazed and overjoyed in the early days that I was able to access these, but they didn't have the cachet that they have today. Um, they were just as good, but they just didn't have the cachet. They weren't heavily promoted by the, the distillery on it. Yeah, I can't even think of if Kleinies 14, Kleinies 14 was in bottle. It was, it was sure. Fauna, and then it yeah. had become its own thing. It was all Fauna. So it was it was being bottled and sold, but not, you know, you know, there wasn't a lot of emphasis behind it uh, in terms of bringing it to the market. And yeah, so that's, so that's, yeah, that's, that's the, the Eleuthera recipe. And why Eleuthera? Why Eleuthera? <laughs> That's twin codes. That was, uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, you know, one of my my old friends, Jeff Robards, had an old family house right just off. You can't see it off, uh, off the screen there. And you know, we used to go there. He'd invite us, you know, many marches, and 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 it was there one year that I decided, you know, I, I, I conceived the idea for a new blending company, and I wanted to. I, I thought I would do it within the big company I was working for. And I went to them at the highest level and said, here's my plan. Here's what I'd like to do. They said, nice idea. It won't be, it's too small. It'll never be commercially big enough for us. And I really, you know, hemmed and hawed about that for a long time. And it was literally on holiday, on the island of Eleuthera, where you know, one morning I just turned to Amy and I said, you know what? I'm just going to do this myself. So that was where the sort of aha moment was. There, you know, I realized, you know what, I, I can do this. I, I, I can, I'm gonna, so I'm going to resign. I'm going to start my own Scotch whiskey company. Um, so I just thought Eleuther deserved a place in the business. And I love the idea of the name. It comes from a Greek word that has to do with freedom, the idea of freedom. And I love the idea of working in the corporate world for years, so the idea of freedom of having your own business. So it worked for me. Although, as my father pointed out, he pointed out for a salary, pointed out for Eleuther. Those don't sound like Scotch whiskey names, John. <laughs> they does, but that was that, that was part of their power, and um, and I think the way you presented whiskey uh, gave a different group of people, a different group of drinker, permission almost to look at it when when so many of the other bottles on the shelf were very male looking in terms of color palette. I mean, we can't really. We shouldn't generalize about colors for boys and colors for girls, but there were a lot of the same kind of quite muted tones um, and things that just referred to obscure places in Scotland or uh, or implied that you had to learn an enormous a bit amount about them or that place or that production facility or some 19th century gentleman who started the, the blending house, whereas you just produced beautiful looking whiskey that people would pick up for different reasons, be it men, women, or whoever. That was, that was very much what I wanted to do. That was the original idea is to make the joys of one of the world's greatest drinks more approachable to more people, full stop. And, you know, a lot of what my thinking, a lot of my thinking at that time was inspired by the world of wine in the US in particular, where I, you know, I'm from. And I worked in the, the wine business before getting into Scotch whiskey, and I was very much inspired by it. And I can tell you, I could hold it up right now. You could Google it and find it. <clears throat> and there was a moment when I thought, you know, I remember seeing an old advert uh, for uh, the Robert Mondavi winery. Um, and it was Robert Mondavi and Francis Ford Coppola, who's some people know, the director, went on to be a, wine, a winemaker, is today. And it was um, it was the two of them in like a, with, film library and the, the, the line at the bottom was Francis saying to Robert, wine is art, Robert taught me that. And that was also a really early inspiration for me. Just that moment, like when I read that on a plane or something in a wine magazine, it's like, wait a minute, you know, there aren't enough people in Scotch whiskey like Robert Mondavi, you know, who started his, his namesake winery when he was in his 50s and transformed the industry in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Or, you know, people like who are attracted to it for the sake of art, like Francis Ford Coppola. I was like, why don't we have this in Scotch whiskey? And that really, that was a, uh, another aha moment before Luthra, where I was still working for the company where I thought, we need more small brands with really high quality approaches, doing things on their own terms, in terms of the individuals. 
And when you started this commitment to discussion of flavour and where flavour comes from, was that paired with it right from the beginning? Because, Absolutely. yeah, to, to my impression, when I started, that there was this burgeoning interest in it, but the industry was a little bit slow to actually just be honest about where flavour comes from. And arguably, you could still say, you know, there are problems there still. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it was, it was sort of an example of that and what it was like back then. I used to describe scotch with some scotch whiskies as delicious when I worked for the big company and, and with my colleagues and people, I, I, people used to say to me, delicious, that's not a whiskey word. You can't describe scotch whiskey as delicious. <laughs> and I went, for to us today, that seems crazy. But 20 plus years ago, that was re a reality. People, oh, that's, you can't describe whiskey as delicious. You know, that was a very different time, very different time. But the idea of flavor, being open about talking to people about where flavors are coming from in terms of distilleries and letting people know the recipes and the wood, the cast types and the ages and all this stuff was, you know, fundamentally important to me. And despite, you know, the crazy labels and what people thought of as crazy labels and names, I knew at the end of the day, coming from the world of wine, as I did, that you could do as long as you had to have quality liquid in the bottle. If you're going to try to push the boat out on, you know, presentation and so forth, that was important for the beginning. Yeah, it just seems like there's, and to arguably there still is this kind of idea that that flavor is just monolithic. And it, why does the single malt whiskey distillery produce whiskey that tastes like it does? Well, it just does. You know, it's it's water, it's geology. It's okay. These things are are a bit outdated now, but in 2000 they weren't, and you still heard that from people within the industry and that the flavor just kind of sprang forth magically and the people operating the distilleries were just custodians of making sure that kind of happened by yeah. replacing dents whereas i think in 20 years we've come a long way from that and um, and uh, your work on on wood and blending in particular uh, has certainly helped that thank you for saying that well, so, it leads us on probably to our next tram. I don't know if you want to say anything more about Eleuthera, but... Um, well, I think, you, yeah, we've got a nice segue into the next one, don't we? We do, don't we? Which is, wood. when we start talking about wood, which is yeah. uh, drown number three. So uh, we are now looking at Spice Tree. Mm, yeah. The inaugural and illegal and deeply naughty batch. <laughs> <laughs> um deeply <laughs> indeed yeah this is so this is this is from my home bar it's one open actually at the moment i don't have many of them but uh so uh, you know being inspired by the world of wine being frustrated frankly you know working in the industry being over here in the uk for a couple of years of, you know before starting compass box and you know i, I would i'd say that People in the industry, uh, you know, this 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 malt whiskey or even this grain whiskey from a first fill bourbon barrel, you know, an active cask giving lots of vanilla character and so forth. It's delicious. You know, this is gorgeous. Why don't we do more of these? Why don't we, you know, use more of these kinds of casks? And you know, the kinds of responses I used to get in the late '90s were things like, "Well, this is just the way we do it. You know, we do a portion of this and a proportion of those and a proportion of those casks, and that's most of its refill and that casks, and that's just the way we've always done it." And that just wasn't good enough for me, <laughs> especially when I'm, you know, working in an industry that's in dec you know, de decline. <laughs> it's like well, you got, you've got to question things, you know. So wood was always, you know, of great interest to me, you know, and also coming from from a wine background. So you know, this was your know, early days, and I, were, I I got in touch with do the late Dr. Jim Swan in the very earliest days of Compass Box. And he, he taught me much of what I know about uh, maturation and, and oak. And one of the things he did is, he, you know, we, I told him about my, my, my question is, why do winemakers get all the good oak and whiskey makers get, a, you know, arguably in general terms, a, a, an inferior quality of oak casks? And he said, well, we've worked, I've worked with, you know, wine casks. Because he, no, no, people, people who know the name Jim Swan, they've associated with whiskey, but he actually worked quite a bit in the world of wine, um, especially in the 90s. And... So he, he gave me the idea of using, of going to France and sourcing oak made for winemakers and bringing it back to Scotland. And that's what we did to make spice tree. So this was, but we did it, you know, I did it in a form originally, not today the way we do it, but 
but, but originally I did it in a form that was novel for Scotch whiskey, not novel for the world of wine. We've used those. We use interstates, it's flat oak interstates, made from the same high quality oak they made their, this Cooperage made their best barrique, their best barrels from. And I brought it to Scotland, had guys at Spaceside Cooperage put, yeah, there's those Cecil Oak, Quercus Petraea is what we're talking about here for, for botanists out there. That's that's a picture of me at Kew Gardens, Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew, which is not far from my house, uh, just last month or so. That's a Cecil Oak tree behind me. Um, and this is the stuff that, you know, when you, you know, when you, there it is being air dried, you know, air dried oak was not something that whiskey barrels tended to be made of back then. But winemakers knew when you air dry the wood for 12 or 18 months or even more, you know, you get, you know, you get essentially, you know, better, more interesting flavors in, in the oak to, 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 to share with the whiskey or the wine, whatever it's aged in. So we use the interstate form. And I always looked at it as an evolution of oak aging. You know, 500 years from people distilled malted barley spirit, malted barley mash in Scotland, they didn't age in oak for, for a long time. That was an evolution, oak was. So I saw this as an evolution. And we put 10 year old malt whiskeys into these barrels with French oak, new French oak interstaves. And it was turned in within a year or so, it turned into this delicious, rich style of malt whiskey. Clove character comes out. I absolutely water. love down clove. Yeah, and that's that's natural. That's you know when you toast heavily Quercus petraea, Cecil oak, you you get this kind of clove character. There's a compound behind that, and that's why we called it Spice Tree. And we released it, and we we were very open about it. Um, you might remember the malts list back in the day. Um, you know, I was shared with all those guys, you know, exactly what we did, all the details, interstaves, everything. And there was a lot of debate about it. And not everybody understood that. Some people, oh, it's a cheap shortcut, but not the quality of oak we were using. And uh, it was all good overall, but the Scotch Whiskey Association just didn't see it as an evolution of traditional practice. They, they didn't want us to, to do this. So we ended up having to stop using that technique. But you adapted the technique to, so rather than an inner ring of staves, you adapted the cask heads. Have I remembered that correctly? Yeah, that's what we did. So I tried my best to convince them this is a good thing. You know, no one's using a quality of oak back then. You know, this is 2005. A quality of oak like this is my argument. And the quality of the whiskey, you know, we had won awards by the time I was having these debates with the Scotch Whiskey Association. Quality of the whiskey is, you know, established. This is a good thing. And I said, well, but it's not a traditional practice, so you can't do it. And in any case, we couldn't afford to, to take them to court and all that, so we had to stop using that, that, that process. So now what we're doing what we did, again, with the help of Dr. Jim Swan at the time, we put the, the same French oak on the heads of barrels. and. You know, it took a longer period of time than just using the interstays, but we got to a similar kind of flavor profile. But today, this is this the, this original batch is actually much lighter than than, the, than today's batch. Today's batch is much richer. Today's batches we do today we mix a, we use a mix of three different toast levels of French oak. Okay, this was one back then, so this is much simpler. But I do love the way it's, it, it tastes today. You know, it, it's, it's it benefits from a little bit of you know. Bottle age, you know, a little uh, old whiskey ness, and it, it's yeah, it's 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 a slightly different thing, but uh, uh, it's you know, it's a lovely flavor profile that you can't get without great quality oak. Yeah, I get a lot of kind of nectarine as, along with that spice. It does start to make me think of Christmas, but pomanders, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, posh yeah. candles as well. I get maybe a waxiness. Let's let's just have a little look there. So. You've used a <clears throat> special Highland malt blend and a little bit of Glen Elgin, basically, but the yeah. defining driver of flavor is this, is this cask. So that Highland malt blend was a combination of malt whiskeys from three distilleries, Tinanek, Dalyun, and Klein Leash, those three distilleries. And it was primarily from Klein Leash back then. And yeah, that's what we, so we blended those together, put it into French oak, into, well, in this batch, we put it into casks that had French oak interstates. And uh, and then we then we then when we it came out, 
you know, quite heavy with and rich with oak. We blended in, in this case, malt whiskeys from the Glen Elgin distillery aged in a, in a bourbon barrel. Not touched, hasn't touched French oak, this, this Glen Elgin malt whiskey. Um, we blended that in just to kind of create a, a nicer balance um, to, to, it's not, you know, just to create, bring in a little bit more of a, of a, of a fruity, uh, um, even waxy distillery character, um, ethereal kind of character to it. So yeah, that, and that's basically the same way we approach it today. It's 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 a, today it's about eighty percent typically malt whiskeys finished in French oak, about twenty percent malt whiskeys aged just in American oak. Um, but you know every batch is you know is about getting the, the balance right. Before we move on to the double single, I just wonder. A lot hangs on that word traditional, doesn't it? And indeed, were there frustrations? to do with how they focused on the traditional cask, but then it's so easy to respond with what about when you come to actual production at the distillery? And where do they draw that line of tradition in? Okay, they're talking about it in the 2000s, but we know that production has changed greatly from traditional, if you draw the line of traditional as the 50s or 60s, and I don't know, I just don't like this suggestion that seems to be quite rigidly struck, stuck to that whiskey has never changed. Yeah, that's um, marketing. Yeah, that's just fake marketing. Um, I mean, what if you drew the line of tradition in the 1890s? You know, <laughs> right? you know, you could sell one year old spirit if you wanted to color it up with caramel or whatever or worse. Um, but uh, you know, no, I, I, it's not what you'd want to do. But um, yeah, I, I, I think it's just understanding and appreciating that traditions do evolve. And if they don't, then they risk dying. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's, that was the thing. And, and, and that, 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 that's really where we came to loggerheads, myself, the Scotch Whiskey Association back then. Obviously, today they look at things differently because, you know, they just changed guidelines on casks. A year or two ago, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I suppose it's it's a, 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 a comforting blanket of an idea that Scotch whisky has never changed, but um, it faces a few challenges from around the world, let's say. Um, so uh, maybe it does need to change. It does change, way. and it has always changed. You know, we we you know, it's you know. Even the traditional aspects, like casks, they've changed, right? You know, um, but, you know, everything is constantly changing. We're learning as we go. It's it's how how those in authority or position feel in a position of authority are interpreting uh, things and defining what they think is in their best interest. And now we're talking about a lobbying organization here at Scotch Whiskey Association. So there you go. Yeah. What is what are our best interests? Yeah. yeah, we can come back to your 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 brushes with authority in in a short while. I think drum after next possibly seems to be um, uh, where we might talk about that again. But let's let's have a look at the double single. Uh, okay. So drum number four of the evening. Yes, the double single. The double single. There it is. So, yeah. Um, Tatsia um, and Duncan Elphick, they, you know, the, when they were, you know, uh, were they co-proprietors of, of Highlander at this point, or was Duncan working, or uh, Tatsia working for Duncan? I can't recall, but, um, you know, we're talking about originally they came to me in 2004 with an idea for the first, there's Tatsia and the Highlander in. Uh, with an idea, they said, we, we like what you do at Compass Box. They came down to our office. We were under a hairdresser's in, in Marlebone in central London. It was free rent. That's why we were there. It's quite a posh place. Uh, but we had free rent under a hairdresser's. Anyway, they came down to see, see me, and, and they had this idea. And they said, you know, what if we took a single malt and matched it with, perfectly matched it with a single grain whiskey? Let's, you know, we love what you do with, 
you know, they like the idea of a Sila and those beautiful grain whiskeys aged in the first fill American of barrels and the softness and sweetness they bring. Well, what if you perfectly match a malt whiskey with a grain, and we would call it, you know, two single, a single malt, a single grain, we'll call it the double single. And they literally just showed up at my door one day and gave us the idea, gave me the idea. And that was 2004. And it was really well received around the world and lovely, very compass box in its approachability, but with depth. And we rekindled it in 2010, and this is what we're tasting today. Tasting today. Um, and in this case, it's it, we, it was malt whiskey from uh, the Glen Elgin Distillery um, of, a, of, a, of a very well. It was 18 year old malt whiskey is what we have here from the Glen Elgin Distillery. I can say that because it's the youngest component of the two. The, yes, indeed, the grain whiskey was actually older, and the grain whiskey. It completely flips around that equation, that ratio I was talking about earlier about blended scotch in the, in the current era, modern era, tending to be, you know, primarily grain whiskey, 60, 70% grain whiskey in the rest malt. Well, this was 76% to be exact um, of the malt whiskey, that old malt whiskey from the Glen Elgin distillery, you know, first Phil Hogshead, uh, or, or um, yeah, and, uh, um, and then uh, Port Dundas, well, single grain whiskey from the Port Dundas distillery, um, you know, they all referenced, you know, it's old. You know, these whiskeys are, I can talk about the ages. I'm comfortable talking about it because, you know, these whiskeys can't be purchased. So we're not promoting their sales. So uh, the, the, grain whisk, the grain whiskey from Port Dundas distillery was 21 years old. Um, so it's completely flipping on its head, you know, the classic or the current classic ratio of malt to grain whiskey in a blend. But for good reason, that old Port Dundas single grain whiskey from that Port Dundas distillery brings this depth of vanilla and caramel and pastry cream and all that. And it kind of just, it it's like the icing on the malt whiskey cake, if you will. Glen Elgin being you know, with its ethereal character and, and, and waxy kind of an herbal, alternating waxy herbal character at that age, which it can attain. And it just it it just it just makes it sweeter and sexier in a sense, you know. Um, the grain, the malt whiskey, the grain whiskey does that. It's like a you know, yeah. That that triggers two thoughts uh, for me. Firstly, Glen Elgin, uh, nothing associated with raw malt whiskies. Whenever it says the word, anyone says the the words Glen Elgin, we have to mention. Alex McCulloch, who's been working at our shop longer than Kia. Um, and at the beginning, I believe, Glen Elgin was his favorite whiskey, and it is still his favorite whiskey. And we're so yeah. lucky to have someone like Alex. So, shout out to Alex, who yeah. has sold more Glen Elgin than anyone except possibly you, John. Um, <laughs> okay. has been good, good smuggled in with lots of fine quality grain. But then, I suppose the other thing that beyond just hedonism, the way you've treated grain whiskey um, and used it as such a delicious component is really interesting and that's another thing that I think possibly the big industry I, I don't know because it's hidden from me but how they blend with grain feels very different to the past and people talk about 50s and 60s blends being better then and they argue that that is possibly because of a higher quality of single malt or uh, a higher ratio of single malt either. But mm -hmm. when I've looked at past ledgers, you see grain in different types of casks, lots of different ages within, uh, within blends. And mm -hmm. whereas it does feel a bit like padding in a lot of more mm -hmm. modern blends. Today. But that's a rather uh, that's guesswork on my side. But when I have looked at very old ledgers, you do notice the way that grain is treated mm -hmm. with uh, a little more of a cerebral way, a little bit of thinking about its flavor, um, yeah. just in, in, in the way they've got their records. And because yeah, it does I really have, respect the way you view it, grain. It does have flavor and, and it, it, it's whiskey, it's not vodka. You know, it, it comes come up as still quite high compared to malt whiskey, but it is whiskey. And yeah, you have different cast treatments or different cast types and different ages. And you've got, you've got a, a, you've got a palette of flavor there. Like you have a palette of flavor for malt whiskey. The spectrum isn't as great as that of malt whiskey, but it's not nearly, 
but it's it's a spectrum that you have to 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 to, to use. Um, and it, it is when, when we've done for years and years and years, we do blending school, we call it. And you know, where we bring in and I've done it around the world, usually for single malt clubs, right? So, you know, very often it's it's just tables filled with people who come in thinking I drink single malts and that's it. And they come to a compass box tasting. We do this blending school and we give them five malt whiskeys and one grain whiskey. And we do, you know, we'll choose a beautiful, you know, usually an old grain whiskey in the teens or something like that. And inevitably, and this is not an exaggeration, at least 90% of the people around the room at the end of the night, they create their own whiskey with this. More, probably greater than 95% of everybody over the years we've done this ends up using the grain whiskey in their blend with one or two other, three other single malts. And I would always love to point that out at the end of the evening. Well, who used this? Who used that? Who used the grain whiskey? And, you know, all the hands, most of the hands go up. And I say to them, well, you just created blended scotch whiskey. So I, I hope that you've proved to yourself that, first of all, grain is not neutral, but also that, you know, forget about category, forget about form. We're going on flavor here, and you chose that because it, grain, that good grain whiskey offers something to to a whiskey maker. So anyway, and, that, and this, I think, double single proves that. Thank you, Tessie. Yeah. Yeah. It's really delicious and, and great to think about. Good folk like Duncan and, of course, Tats, who I see from time to time, who's just yeah. another wonderful servant to Scotch whiskey, Absolutely. quietly and, and, and beautifully doing his work. Uh, such Absolutely. a popular guy. Um, and if we are talking about grain, then absolutely, let's uh, let's have a look at the next round, which is the last fatted grain. Um, right. And uh, also brings us back to a little bit about definitions. And again, in the, the preparation to this tasting, um, there's a bit of water under the bridge now in terms of when that legislation was changed and the definitions of Scotch whiskey. And yeah. it provoked a lot of discussion, and um, you were more vocal, I guess, in, in that discussion than, than we were as a retailer. But we were all watching it, and now time has passed, and well, we can have a little chat about how that worked out, really, can't we? <laughs> so, single malt, well, blended whiskey, single malt, blended malt, and blended grain became the new uh, definitions. Uh, but it could have taken a different path, I feel. Yeah, definitely. So this whiskey was released in 2011, but if you go back to 2008, that's when uh, the Scotch Whiskey Association, you know, on behalf of the industry, uh, Scotch Whiskey Industry was lobbying Parliament to upgrade uh, the, the, the law, revise UK law on Scotch whiskey. And one of the there were a lot of really important and smart aspects to the legislation they were proposing but one of the most contentious was around definitions now believe it or not you know all the various types of scotch whiskey had not been codified into law at that time and so you know, it was a smart thing to do to codify it into law because you could put a blended you could call a, a blended scotch whiskey uh, various different things you could call them there was confusion around pure malt and vatted malt and single malt and all that. So it made sense to do this, but what didn't make sense was this idea to take the idea of a blends of single malts, and which had traditionally been called vatted malt whiskeys. We, we use the term vatted malt on some labels. This is Luther we tasted tonight. We, we labeled back in the day all malt Scotch whiskey because you know, we were able to do that back then. But the idea in hedonism, you know, a blend of single grain whiskeys, a blended grain whiskey, you know, we actually, you know, we, we, we used to label this as a vatted grain whiskey back in the day. So, yeah, but the legislation proposed calling these things blended malt, blended grain. And the, you know, we, we all felt in the industry that that, that, that was confusing. But consumers were confused enough about what a blended Scotch whiskey actually was. And, you know, and there was this sad perception, which still lingers today, that blended Scotch whiskey, if it says blended, it's inferior. Single is better than blended. So I, I do believe the industry shot itself in the foot with this one. And, and it's now, you know, over 10 years later. And I think, you know, Arthur, I'm pretty sure you agree that it didn't work. It was supposed to, it was supposed to resolve consumer confusion. I think it enhanced consumer confusion over time. We, 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 
we put together a campaign. You know, we had an online petition, and I looked at it just the other day with the guys in the office. It's actually still on there. You can Google. Uh, <laughs> if you Google, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, no to blended malt scotch whiskey. <laughs> okay, we can argue whether that was the best way to do it. Oh dear, I think John's just clicked the wrong button and uh, and taken himself out of the conversation. I do hope he joins me in a moment, or it could be, I suppose, uh, a Wi-Fi issue. I don't know. But um, we, where are we? We're on the last matted grain. Um, so that is, uh, sorry, this one here, uh, which if I can just show you while we're up, John. You click on the wrong button. Yeah, I got a little excited. <laughs> <laughs> Looking anyway. for your online petition. Yeah, um, let me find it. Yeah, sure. But uh, yeah, you can still sign up today if you want. But uh, sorry, you carry on, Arthur. Where were you? You looked like you were doing <laughs> explaining things quite well. I was just, I was just kind of filling time for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, but I suppose the proof is as a retailer, although I'm not in the shop too much, I pass by. I do the odd tasting, and I think the problem is really good whiskeys become too difficult to talk about because still, as soon as you say that word blended, and if we just deal with blended malt, so a mix of two malt whiskeys from two unbelievable distilleries, delicious distilleries like Klein Leach and Kalila, that process of blending does not should not make it less valuable. And with skill, such as the skill that you show, it should make it more valuable. But, um, and also allow the producer to produce at perhaps a bit more scale and maybe get, get the price down a little bit. But in flavor terms, it should become more valuable because you've got not this element of chance through maturation, through a distillery that's just matured to a certain point, and then you've got a skillful person taking another single malt and ameliorating it with the skill of blending. But the definitions do not do that. And, and, and the other problem is for me still is it doesn't address the fact that in blended whiskey, there is something so different. <laughs> Grain whiskey, you know, different equipment, yeah. different yeah. ingredients, different, you know, different production regime. Everything is different about it. And it's closer to an American whiskey, a bourbon whiskey for me, um, in production, and even has similar more similarities with rum, you could argue, mm. when it gets to great age than it does with single malt whiskey. Mm. And Consumers still aren't getting that. So every single tasting I do starts with, right, well, this is how you make malt whiskey. But then there is this other thing that is made so in such a different way. And the legislation, the, ter the terminology just does not address this. It, it, it does still feel like a missed opportunity. And I do walk yeah. in and out of the shop and I do overhear clunky discussions between our staff who are extremely knowledgeable and very good at communicating but you just hear people switch off when they're mm -hmm. trying to sell a very good blended malt. As soon as they hear the word blend, that's not as good. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, it is changing though. And, you know, it's, let's face it, you know, at, 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 from a scientific perspective, there's no difference between a single malt whiskey and a blended malt whiskey, other than, you know, single malt whiskey comes from one place and you know, one single distillery. But as a scientific level, there's no, there's no difference. Um, but you know, this is um, uh, we, you know, we we tried to make this point. You know, we we I was I interviewed. You know, the press, you know, why fairly widely at the time for this, and uh, but uh, I couldn't. We I even wrote. You know, goes in touch with Defra. You know, Defra was responsible for uh, investigating the, the the basis for the legislation and, and then recommending it to Parliament. And I was in touch with them quite a bit. I was interviewed by them and wrote them a considered letter and so on and so forth. But. Blended malt whiskey and blended green whiskey came to be. It was decided by two people. It was not widely researched. I offered to do global research for them. I offered to, you know, because with, with, with David Jones, a former colleague from mine at the big company who was an expert in this area, we were going to help them. And they turned it all down. And it was, it was two guys in a room who came up with this. It was not, you know, it was not based on comprehensive consumer research or anything of the sort. 
But anyway, happily, I'm not, yeah, I'm happily not, the industry seems in buoyant health anyway. It wasn't the. It, it just feels like a bit of a missed opportunity to 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 educate. Indeed. To, right. So what do we do? So we, we lost that that one and vatted malts and vatted grains as a term that you could put on a label where about to be outlawed. The legislation was passed. There was a grandfather period that allowed producers until November twenty second, two thousand and eleven to um, you know, change your labels. That, that, so that was the last opportunity anyone could had to uh, bottle and ship a, a scotch whiskey, um, a bottle of a, a scotch whiskey with vatted malt or vatted grain on it. So we decided to celebrate it. Some might say, you know, <laughs> eulogize it. <laughs> but uh, uh, we had a party uh, on November 22nd, 2011 in London. Um, we had a party at Duck Soup, the restaurant in Soho, and uh, 30 or 40 of us, you can see there, we walked uh, to, uh, to the bridge just, in the, uh, under, just underneath uh, Big Ben. And as the clock struck midnight, just before it struck midnight, we pounded the last cork into the last bottle, not of the last vatted grain. We also did its companion, the last vatted malt. Um, and that the last legally bottled vatted malt in the UK was 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 uh, was 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 bottled on that bridge, Westminster Bridge, on that night at eleven fifty nine fifty nine. So it was a party. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry to miss it. So there is that bottle. And well, that's last vatted grain. So we were well, last vatted malt. But, but anyway, we didn't have enough of last vatted malt in the archives for for this tasting. So we we went to last vatted grain, of which we have very little as well, because we made very little of the last vatted grain. Um, very few bottles indeed. 297 bottles is all that we produced of this. Um, and as you can see, there are four parcels that we drew from from four distilleries, the Cameron Bridge Distillery, Inver Gordon Distillery, Port Dundas Distillery, and some quite a old um, uh, whiskey from the Karst Bridge Distillery. So Karst Bridge, uh, Caledonian, Cambus, those are grain whiskey distilleries we've talked about tonight, all sadly now closed distilleries. Um, the, uh, and I can tell you the ages because again, this is not, no one's gonna be able to buy this very easily, certainly not from us. Um, it was the, the, the biggest portion of it was 35% of Cameron Bridge from a first fill barrel at 14 years old, okay, which brought the a vibrancy. But everything else was 20, 29, and 42 years old. So 30% of it was 42 year old whiskey from the Inver Gordon distillery, 20% uh, of it was 20 year old whiskey from the Port Dundas distillery, and 14% was 29 year old whiskey from the Carsbridge Distillery. So Greg Glass put this one together. Uh, he gets the credit for this one. Uh, just a lovely melange of aged grain whiskeys. Mm. And I, I love that style. A style in itself, not just grain whiskey, but aged grain whiskey. Um, it's, it's up there with young smoky whiskey or you know, um, big sherry cask whiskey. It is a style in itself that people should learn to love. Mm. Um, so I'm aware of time is, is, is rattling on. I'm, I'm glad we talked you down from 12 drams or whatever your, your <laughs> <crazy> <laughs> initial <laughs> proposal for this tasting uh, was. Well, but, um, we just had a lot to right, share. Yeah, and it's very kind of you. So uh, the general, something of a cult whiskey. The general, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is one I'm, if you could do it again, if you could find that parcel, you would do it again because lots of people still talk about this one. Mm. Yeah, this was good fortune for sure. I think I kind of summed it up on the back label. I, I wrote the first line of the back label. It's been a good year for sourcing ridiculously rare parcels of extraordinary whiskey, <laughs> <laughs> is what it says. That and, sounds like a good year. No, that sounds like a good year. <laughs> <laughs> and so these were, this was a simple, in a way, combination of two parcels of old whiskeys offered to us, one from, uh, you know, uh, one of the most esteemed independent bottlers in the business and one from a broker. And they were both, they both had a similar story in that neither party knew what the whiskeys were other than one was a blend of single malts that had been in cask for a minimum of 40 years. 
and the other was a blend of malt whiskey and grain whiskey. It was a blended scotch that had been in cask for a minimum of 30, 33 years. I mean, the youngest, the, the, the age of the youngest spirit, that is to say, was 33. The other one, the age of the youngest was 40. So there's, you know, likely whiskeys in there that were considerably older. And, you know, Greg and I at the time, you know, the good fortune of getting these parcels, they were both so extraordinary. And I actually argued for a while that we should just bottle them as they were, ind independent, individually. And Greg, to his great credit, said, John, <laughs> we are blenders. <laughs> and let's see what happens when we work them together. And and we did. And that's that's how this blend came came about. We had a little left over of one, and I can't remember which one it was, but um, it was a 33-year-old blended scotch. But it was, now I don't remember. But, Anyway, yeah, that's how it how it came to be. And what you know, this is antique whiskey. You know, this is, um, yeah, this is you know, I'm gonna switch glass types to the last two. So my these lovely Italian top glasses, I love. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But boy, does it smell like very old and but still powerful. Yeah. Well, it's the, the bottling strength. It was cast strength at fifty three point four. Now that tells you at those ages. They were some or maybe all of those components, many of those components were probably distilled in the times you know, when 60s, 70s, when there was a shortage of warehouse space and they were filling casks at higher strengths. And and so thus, given the great age, still, you know, 53%. But, you know, that's, you know, that's quite, quite a lot of concentration in there. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and the cast types, you know, obviously there's sherry cask aging in there, and, and who knows, um, there could have been some old wine-treated Paxret casks in there. there. There's probably a you know, fair chunk of just American oak aged hogsheads and stuff. We don't know. I had no idea. No idea of the provenance, but didn't care. Don't care because of what the quality you know, the, the, that we perceive that these things had, these parcels had. Mm. Yeah, it's quite lovely marmalade on brown toast there's heads of smoke there's polished furniture there's oh, it's it's big it's profound it's um that's one of the most eloquent descriptions of this whiskey i've ever heard my heart oh, it's beautiful uh, uh, warming <laughs> and, up and, and insightful in, and insightful <laughs> warming, i mean well the really fancy stuff the old stuff that's you are starting to look for slightly vague, eloquent terms that <laughs> are kind of meaningless. But I think when you get a whiskey that is profound, whenever you use that word, mm. it's something special, and it often comes with something of great age that has has lasted well and has mm. continued to to stay good and and, yeah. and improve. How much yeah. in, in your blending process? How much is chance is does chance feel like a lot of it i mean this one is slightly different but it's triggered the thought in my head i mean you, you mm -hmm. had the the good luck i don't know what that independent bottler was doing moving it on to you but so the luck that it's fallen into your lap but um how much is is engine not engineered that's the wrong word you've planned out you you know what the single malts taste like therefore you think if i add two of this one of that one of this I will get this or how much is happy accident as you go along experimentation yeah a happy accident does take place i mean i talked about a, the first a, a luthra earlier tonight um you know a happy an accident or something that we didn't you know didn't uh you know consider hap would happen and but then it was okay we go to work with what we have and now you've, you you've got the pressure of constraints which is actually quite helpful i think in the creative process but um, yeah, sometimes you just get lucky. Um, not usually, you know. Um, uh, I was listening to Tom Sadas again, actually, uh, the composer interviewed recently, saying, talking about slow movements in, in, in symphonic music and how um, they're actually harder to write than the fast movements, even though there's fewer notes <laughs> in a slow movement. And uh, yeah, he was saying he was all he's always skeptical. He, he happened to write one movement for a silo, I think it was actually, or Arcadia, Arcadiana, in a in a day. But he said that doesn't usually happen. He said I'm skeptical of anyone who says you know I can write you know a slow movement in a day and I can write 365 slow movements in a year. And I just made me think that made me think of the whiskey making process. You know, occasionally 
you get a sense, your intuition is right, and you get a sense for something, and put them together, and you're like that really, that, that's what I, I think I hoped it could be, and more. But usually it's a long, drawn out process, it takes months. So, you know, so for example, James and I, with the whiskey we'll finish on this evening, you know, Rogue's Banquet, that was, uh, I will get the numbers wrong, but the order of magnitude is, is close enough. That was six months of work and almost 40, 30 odd, almost 40 different prototypes over the course of that time, where, you know, we create a recipe, prototype, we give it a few days, taste it, talk about it with, our, you know, with the group. Uh, and then decide. Okay, well, what do we? Where do we go from here? Did it meet our expectations? If so, yes. If not, why? Right? If, if if not, why not? And what do we do next? And it's just this iterative process. And um, and sometimes you end up with what you're trying for, and sometimes you end up in a totally new space. And that's why actually you can actually see it on the screen. That little well, that's the share and enjoy uh, motto uh, in, in our main blending room. But in our new blending room next door to that is on the wall of Picasso quotation. You know, I. He says, he's apparently said, I start with an idea, then it becomes something else. Hmm. And that's the way most of our projects go. Sometimes luck, but usually it's an iterative process and you don't always end up where you're going, where you're intended to, but we won't put it in a bottle if we don't end up in a place where we've got something compelling. Hmm. Fascinating. This has rumbling depth. It's, uh, this <laughs> rumbling depths i love it i'm writing that down <laughs> <laughs> i will be coming back to that i've not finished my glass i will absolutely no. be coming back to that after this evening uh is is concluded so we come to a whiskey that people we can sell you <laughs> <laughs> although tonight is not about that you have been very generous in terms of uh, accessing all these bottles from uh, from the company archive and, uh, and getting them sent up to edinburgh to get a properly rebottled and um yeah. thank you again for liberating them but we come on oh, to a project you're welcome. um we come up to a project that is uh, on the shelves now just to hit the shelves and um, is bottled to celebrate your 20th anniversary, Rogue's mm -hmm. Banquet. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, the way uh, you know we, we decided to structure this tasting is these first six whiskeys up till now, up till Rogue's. It's not split exactly first decade, second decade, but it's close enough. And um, so those first six whiskeys kind of you know helped me tell, and thank you, Arthur, for your help in that, telling this, the story of the the first decade or so of, of, of Compass Box. And, and uh, but I, I do want to finish this session and next week's you know, companion session uh, with, with a whiskey that people can actually get their hands on. Um, and yeah, this one and the, 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 the Hedonism Felicitas will finish off next week's session with our you know, two, two, two key limited, uh, sorry, anniversary whiskeys that we, we, we did. And this is a James Saxon creation, um, Rogue's Banquet. Um, in the early days, so I talked about six months and 30 odd prototypes. <laughs> I actually came up with a picture of this the other day. I took a picture of one of our whiteboards. I don't have it tonight, but, and it was, we were describing what he was getting in the early blends here, the early prototypes as like cake and decadent. And it took us, you know, as, as we kind of evolved the recipe over the months, we kept thinking about the descriptors we were you know, applying to it and this idea of decadence and pastries and and, and <laughs> cake. I know there's another cake out there, whiskey out there, but you know, there we had no no idea what that was. Doing. But this is yeah, um, stuck in our minds. And uh, around as we finalized the recipe and got it close to what we loved and to what you have in the bottle. We, 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 the name Rogue's Banquet came out of this idea that banqueting and feasting. Um, and I had recently at the time been down the road from our office and bought at an antique store an old copy of Beggar's Banquet, uh, a classic Rolling Stones album. And, and I brought it back into the office and you know, we were, I thought, well, that'd be cool. But you, know, you open up the Beggar's Banquet, it's got that classic picture of the stones, you know, looking louche over this feasting table. And, with, I can't call it Beggar's Banquet, we'll get in trouble for that. But Rogue's Banquet somehow popped into James's mind one, over a weekend, as I recall, and we thought, perfect. And we peopled it with these rogues, many of which are from old Compass Box labels, and that made it to us a perfect anniversary whiskey. And again, 
No, although if you've tasted it you and you don't know the structure of this recipe, you will ne probably never have guessed that this is a blended Scotch whiskey. This is malt whiskey and grain whiskey again. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's not like any blended Scotch whiskey you can find <laughs> typically. Yeah, I was with the, with the cake. I was very much a chocolate cake. I was <laughs> chocolate milkshake, malted milks, that kind of. It is malty, absolutely. I, I guess you're saying you wouldn't perceive the grain element, which is actually significant. There's a quarter of it in there, isn't there? Yeah, it's a quarter. It's but it's twenty five percent, twenty six percent, and it's old grain whiskey. Um, uh, I can tell you the youngest component is is. It's a malt whiskey from the Glen Elgin distillery, and it's just two percent of the recipe, and it's nineteen years old. But because this is a, 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 a whiskey that is available to, to buy today, we are not legally permitted to tell you the age of the other components. Uh, hang on. If I or, ask, I can ask, can't I? And then you can tell me. If people ask us, we are permitted to tell them. We're just not permitted to proactively uh, communicate. Well, I'm asking if you're dancing. Okay, <laughs> and here's how, and, and this is a really good example. If you could see the rest of the wheel again, uh, an example of why this the, this law up. really doesn't make sense for, for whiskeys like ours. If you can read, I know it's really small, but 2% of the recipe there is from the Glen Elgin Distillery, Richard Barrels, and it's 19 years old. Okay, brings us a lovely classic Glen Elgin character we've talked about tonight. And uh, the balance of it, every other component, all three other components are 25 years old, okay? And they, they represent the Milton Duff Distillery from a Richard Hogshead, um, the Klein Leach Distillery from a Refill Hogshead, and, uh, and then that, that grain whiskey port, port portion from the North British Distillery from First Fill Bourbon Barrels, it's 25 years old as well. So, you know, that's, there's only 2% that's 19, but legally we're only permitted to tell you that there's 19 year old whiskey here. And in this case, when we're, we're ready to show you all the details, we don't think that makes sense. And our transparency campaign is something that uh, is for another, a discussion another day, but uh, um, something we really believe in. We should have the, the, the ability to, to be open about these things if we're not, you know, misleading people as to, to the actual ages of our, of our whiskeys. But a grain whiskey. Yeah. Thankfully, we do have another day. We have a second part to this tasting, so we can, really come, we can come back to the transparency debate okay. and the, the, the logic of that later on. But I should also, um, I've already mentioned your generosity in, in providing these bottles and, and getting them into uh, miniature bottles at a, a price that, um, that is, uh, well, a bargain for the, these excellent eggs and drams. But also, you have sent us one of these. It's not quite showing up in the light, but... That is bottle 690 from the very first batch of Hedonism. Is that 690? Because that's the last, that would be the last bottle. Is that right? Huh. Is that six, so 690 of 690? It doesn't actually say how many is in the batch, but you're the man. No, too. it should. Yeah, it should say on the top 18. Mine says 18 of 690. I'd hand label these oh, uh, High, Highlander in. Nonsense. John, John, <laughs> okay. this is bottle 345 of All 690. All right, fine. Okay, because if it was 690 of 690, I think people would really like that. <laughs> well, I think people would still like this. So um, if you buy a bottle of Compass Box, a 50CL or a 70CL bottle of Compass Box over the next month or so until November the 15th, that's right, you'll be automatically entered into a draw to win that bottle. Uh, which I genuinely believe is, uh, well, did that did that whiskey change the industry? No, but it was the first whiskey you bottled, and you certainly did change the industry, John. Um, it's a piece of history. Uh, I've no doubt about that. So there's full terms and conditions on our uh, on our website. You'll see a banner that, that launches from the homepage. Um, so, yeah, and if you buy two bottles, you're entered twice. Da, 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 da. But... Um, so thank you. Uh, it was a great pleasure just to see one of those bottles again and, and remind me of those yeah. early innocent days of the industry. I'm sorry um, we didn't have enough to taste in this tasting, but that's this is the next best thing we could do is offer it this yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 uh, it's really really kind of you. Thank you, and uh, I'm sure lots of people will be interested in getting their hands on that. Um, so I did mention there is uh, another tasting to come. 
Uh, so the second part of which I think there are just a few uh, last few packs available of of um, of the tasting pack for Thursday the twenty second of October same time uh, we'll have a, a, another special guest a different special guest to add their thoughts on um, on John and, and what he and his team have achieved uh, and then just to mention some other ones if you don't mind John um, we yeah. are just about to launch a tasting pack for Per Magloire Calvados single cast Calvados mm. you know I love Calvados do you well um, <laughs> This is an interesting one. So uh, Calvados hasn't really been doing much recently, um, but uh, thankfully there's some interesting things happening. And Père Maguire, they have, so it'll be a tasting of the VSOP and then they've taken effectively the VSOP and then put it into X whiskey casks. So I think it's Lefroig, Peter Bunnerhaven and one other, I can't remember. So we'll try samples from those casks. Everyone gets to vote. And then Royal Mile Whiskies will bottle one of those whiskey cast ah, And fantastic. the results are really interesting. I was, I really love Calvados also. And I wasn't sure if I would like that kind of thing, if I can put it like that. But I really have. And I'd be really happy to bottle any of these casks. And one in particular, I am praying that good people choose this one. So we'll have the... We'll have the Maître de Quay, uh, uh, the, the master blender or cellar master um, there to talk us through those, which will be really interesting. And then you've got a Berry Brothers and Rudd tasting with um, Johnny McMillan and uh, Ronnie, Ronnie Cox uh, mm. there, which is be good a veritable fun. rogues <laughs> banquet. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Having banqueted with with, with Ronnie, I, yeah, I can vouch for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, as have I. Um, uh, so I think that's uh, that's kind of us for the evening, John. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I can't wait to thank do you this again. Yeah. Um, uh, well, next uh, week, yeah, and uh, yeah, it's it's been. I, I really am really grateful to to you and to Kier and all the guys at Royal My Whiskies, Alex, and and his love of of of, of, of Glen Elgin and and. and and in support of our whiskeys over the years. Thank you all of you guys. And I look forward to next week. Yeah, great. So I'll say goodbye. And then just as to play us out, we've got a video of the background to this <laughs> launch of Great King Street, is it? Yeah, this was when we launched Great King Street years ago. And we, we you know, it was really, we wanted to make blended Scotch whiskeys that weren't boring. And of course, the silo was, was always around, but we wanted to do something new with even bigger, more forward flavors. Um, and we launched Great King Street, first artist blend. And, and we, for the French market, actually, we did a, a, a little promotional video, a bit, a little bit of craziness. Bit of cowboy vibe, shoot John Glazer shooting from the hip, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so, uh, thanks again, John. I'll, I'll say goodbye right. now and play the I'll video. See and, you next week. And we'll get to questions for the next one. There's been lots of lovely comments, really interesting questions, and uh, we'll save them up and, and we'll put them on the next one. Cheers, John. So, as I say, thanks very much for joining us. I've, it's been such a pleasure to try some of these whiskies. Um, after all these years, which, uh, uh, and yeah, and I hope you enjoyed it too. And as I say, here's John um, acting all tough. Hypocrisy dans la politique. Ce n'est pas bon, ce n'est pas bon, nous n'en voulons pas. Démagogie dans la politique. Ce n'est pas bon, ce n'est pas bon, nous n'en voulons pas. La dictature dans la politique. Ce n'est pas bon, ce n'est pas bon, nous n'en voulons pas. Du bonheur, du bonheur. Ce n'est pas bon, ce n'est pas bon, nous n'en voulons pas. Les dictateurs.
vivre dans la politique. Ce n'est pas bon, ce n'est pas bon, nous n'en voulons pas. Du respect, du respect pour le peuple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. De la paix, de la paix pour le peuple. Oh, 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 oh. Ce n'est pas bon, ce n'est pas bon, nous n'en voulons pas. Hypocrisie dans la politique. Ce n'est pas bon, ce n'est pas bon, nous n'en voulons pas. Démagogie dans la politique. Ce n'est pas bon, ce n'est pas bon, nous n'en voulons pas.